Welcome back to Reality TV, your source for snarky reality TV recaps of all the shows we love and love to hate. I'm Jody, and this week, also known as the week before 90 Day Fiance premieres, I'm bringing you the best and worst moments from Real Housewives of Potomac, Teen Mom 2, and a show that is new to me, Southern Charm. But first, I'm going to keep reminding you to become a member on Patreon because I'm going to peer pressure you into it. It's what all the cool kids are doing. You get to listen to all the stuff that goes on outside of reality shows. You also get the main show, like you're listening to right now, posted to your personal feed on whatever device you're listening on earlier in the week before it's released. Oh, that's not it. You also get exclusive Real Housewives of New York recaps and invite to the secret Patreon-only group. And last week, Patreon members started asking questions and throwing out topics that they wanted to talk about on that Patreon podcast that we don't always have time to talk about here on the main show. So it was just a lot of fun. It's a great, funny community. You ladies are hilarious, or I should say ladies and gentlemen. So head on over to patreon.com slash realitypod. Now, if that is not your cup of apple cider, at least chat with the other listeners and me at Reality TV Pod everywhere. That's Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Now, before we jump into the recap of Southern Charm, I had been warned by many of you about a particular person, and that would be a Mr. Thomas Ravenel. So I did a little evidence search. I've been listening to watch what crappens in other podcasts forever. So the name is not new to me. But boy, ooh, Thomas has got some deep, dark stuff going on as of late. There's a former nanny that has, how do I, she's alleged that he has raped her. And man, it's damn hard to find something that is complimentary to him. So let's just say His behavior is not flattering to anyone in the light of this hashtag Me Too movement. So let's just kind of tuck that into our Gloria Allred tab on our desktops or minds, and let's jump in. Now, right off the bat, uh, what the hell is going on with this theme song? I felt like I was stuck in like a really bad spoken word jazz club with a sorority girl singing because whoever's voice is speaking or singing in that opening, is it a monologue? Is it a song? It's just grating and all the women in the previous clips during the intro all looked the same to me. So I knew I was going to have to construct a flow chart of sorts, something like in that movie, what is it? A Beautiful Mind. I never actually saw that movie, but it sounds about accurate. All right, first scene that greaseball Thomas is slicking back his hair in his douchebag robe. And he's got that smugly mug of his staring at himself. It's how I picture, okay, politics aside, the truth is the truth, okay? It's how I picture Eric and Don Jr., what they do every morning after their nannies wipe the OJ piddle off of their weak chins. And let's just talk about the robe now. I don't actually know a real man who wears a robe like this, if at all. Most guys I know, it's a t-shirt, maybe some Adidas pants or shorts, but I mean, a robe open down to the navel that you just saunter out to the front yard to get the paper. Come the fuck on. So after the little newspaper retrieval, this chick comes on screen who looks so familiar. So I had to pause it and figure it out. Again, this is all old news to you guys, but the hairstylist Chelsea was on Survivor. Why didn't anyone tell me this? And when I looked at her bio, um, she also crosses over into Real Housewives of Beverly Hills because she was an equestrian rider like Teddy. And... She had Lyme disease like Yolanda. She is like the reality TV unicorn. Again, you guys are letting me down here. Why didn't you alert me to this sooner? Well, then I quickly get assaulted in the eyes by some naked guy in a shower. (laughs) Okay, 
totally natural to just have a camera crew in your bathroom while you wash away your morning boner. Maybe that's not how it actually works. I don't know. I, my parents' Catholic school tuition really did pay off, I guess. But then we get to meet Cameron, who has an amazing head of hair. God, she is blessed. So she's talking about being pregnant and induced. And I mean, I wanted to like her, but after the past few weeks and months of Audrey Roloff and her pregnancy journey, I was having doubts on whether I would be able to continue watching. But I remembered all your promises that you gave me about how good the show is. So like Elizabeth Warren, I persisted. Well, here she comes, rounding the bend in a 2016 Nissan. That would be a Miss Catherine Dennis. I'm not sure what she's trying to go for with that severe, deep side part or the red root tap on top of the blonde hair, but I mean, her look altogether looks unhinged. Now, she's gorgeous. I mean, there's no denying that. She's got a nice little hot body. God, that sounds gross. I'm saying it because I'm jealous, okay? But a tip off to a crazy woman is always a meticulous set of bright lips. Sometimes it's a set of crazy eyes that's like an easy giveaway. But I find a perfect, bold, matte, it's got to be matte, just a Bold matte lip signals, mm, bitch, be crazy, especially when it's combined with that soft, nervous, girly girl voice. Now, the only background information I really have on Catherine is that I know she has two babies with Thomas, and there was some kind of drug accusation or alcohol a while back. But at this point in the episode, it's unclear to me where the hell those babies are. Now, I've been involved with the Casey Anthony case extensively, so I tend to get worried when I see hot moms like Catherine without their tots. And when I say I've been involved in the case, I mean my expertise has been accredited only in my own imagination. But who's next? Well, suck le bleu invaders. There's Naomi, who has a dad, I think, who opens restaurants Okay, cool, free food, but I'm not quite sure what Naomi does, but I put a little pin in her and I knew that we were going to be back at her later. Now let's talk about Craig in Austin. This is where I really settled in to my typical snarky bitch self. These two bros meet over beer. Now Austin is just gulping this brew down and it looks like he's missing a piece of his internal throat structure because the amount he gulped down was nothing less than extraordinary and it turns out Naomi the little French Madeline I don't know it was Madeline French whatever Naomi was involved with Craig or used to be involved with him but they broke up and Craig seems <laughs> quite bitter about Naomi never apologizing for stuff that she said or done. But oh, ring, 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 with no producer intervention whatsoever, Naomi calls Austin just then to apologize for yelling at some chick named Peyton at his party. Now, I don't know about Peyton, but I do know I think Craig and Austin are super fucking annoying. Because when Austin was talking to his sister on the phone and then in the brewery, there's just something about him that grates every nerve in my body. He's just so confident, like someone who makes too much eye contact. You know what I'm talking about? Like they're probably a close talker. I don't really like someone who believes in themselves too much. And that's what your Pinterest quote board is for, okay? Like, we don't need an actual human who thinks Oprah and Deepak Chopra lives within them. Now, here's some questions for you. First, where is Austin getting the money to make this beer brand company of his? Is it family money? Does he actually have a real job? Because it doesn't look like he is going anywhere during the day except to taste beer. And I also want to know how Cameron and Shep are related. 
I think they're friends, maybe they're siblings, like there's some sort of big sister motherly bond or were they a couple? I don't think so. There just seemed to be this weird dynamic of family but also flirtation. I don't know. This is so hard because most of you have seen this show and I haven't and I don't really know who the beloved characters are and who the hated are but Cameron... I feel like I want to like her, but just the attention seeking as the world's first pregnant co-pilot was annoying. And Shep seems a little what bit slow. Like besides not knowing what the word emergency is, he ordered a hot tea at lunch. Well, number one, I've never seen nor heard of a man ordering tea at lunch. And number two, hot tea on a hot summer day. Maybe those massive chompers that he's wearing have cut off vital oxygen pathways to his brain. He's just not thinking clearly. And is it just me? Okay, so maybe I have a lot of questions. But does Shep look like a cross between... Daniel Tosh and Bill Rancic to anyone else. And also Cameron's voice is exactly that of Blair on Facts of Life. Like close your eyes, listen to her, and you will be thinking Mrs. Garrett is about to enter the scene and call her down to the candy store. But I digress. Cameron thinks Shep needs to get married and settle down, but he just ends up laughing like Goofy and chomps away at his sandwich wrap. Now, over at Patricia's house, I'm thinking she is kind of like the Lisa Vanderpump of South Carolina. I think that's where they're at because she has a few snowballs of dogs on her lap and She's got her own Rocio in the form of an older gentleman in a red apron and really bad pit stains. So this Craig guy shows up with his ass crack and he starts talking to her about toxic people in his life. And I, uh, I mean, first Shep with the hot tea and now Craig talking about toxic people. Like they are real housewives in 30 something form. But Patricia apparently has a company who makes these fabrics in dresses, maybe pillows. I don't know. I don't care because she's dressed in the most hideously fabulous dress I have ever laid eyes on. I can't tell if I loved it or if I hated it, but just something about Patricia makes me want to buy whatever it is that she is selling. She offers Craig this opportunity to design a pillow. Now, this was like a record scratch Did she just say pillow? Yeah. Okay. So this is where I paused and I did a little sleuthing. I don't know if this is just for a storyline, but I think this guy is serious about designing pillows because he actually referred to himself as an artist. Okay. Well, if slapping some fabric on a pillow makes you an artist, then buy me some wooden word plaques at home goods, and I'm going to call myself an interior designer. Or you know what? Maybe a better comparison would be Catherine thinking her quote, creative, whatever. <laughs> yeah, that's what she says. That makes her a future director of merchandising at Gwen's department store. Uh, no, honey, not with that weak ass handshake. Ladies, please do not do that learn how to shake a damn hand. I cannot stand the soft handshake. And maybe Catherine should have done some deep breathing and preparation before she went in on this interview at Gwyn's. What is Gwyn's, by the way, if any of you live in the Carolina region? What the hell is this place? So Catherine walks into this interview at Gwyn's with the freaking owner of the company, and she can't even sit up straight. She chokes on the first question, and when she's asked how she handles stress, I I don't think there could have been a worse response or worse answer. She says, okay, and this is a quote, "Uh, I don't know how to say it. I need water. And she runs out the fucking door. 
Okay, so I'm just going to say that you don't handle stress very well. Don't call us, we'll call you. I mean, this interview was worse than when I was interviewing a guy for a teaching job. And out of the 16 standard questions we had, he answered only one question because it was the first question, which was, tell us a little bit about yourself. And he kept on talking for the entire 50-minute interview. I mean, the guy told us from his acid reflux diagnosis to his girlfriend's dog. It was bad. It was real, real bad, but it was not as bad as Catherine's umming through one question. Now the interview's over, so thank God we're all put out of our own misery. But let's go to Thomas in the bathroom drinking wine with his girlfriend, Ashley. First of all, she's got a horrible vocal fry, but that aside, what is Thomas's deal? He clearly is not that into Ashley because he says in his little confessional that basically he doesn't plan on her being around that long. Are his kids with him all the time? Because he seems like a real manipulative jerk because he's talking about Catherine to his ex-girlfriend, which means you know he's talking shit about Catherine when the kids are around. Now, fast forward to this party at Naomi's, what is it, Nico restaurant, Everyone looks great. I mean, the women on this show are all stunning. But damn it, that sleazebag Thomas goes from bagging on Catherine to then checking her ass out literally in her leather pants. Like, he doesn't even try to hide it. Full on, scans her body up and down. I counted three times. Then when his girlfriend Ashley walks over... I'm thinking like, oh God, here go hell come. No, he just keeps laying it on thicker that he wants to get with Catherine with his girlfriend standing right there. I mean, he, Erica Janes it and just keeps on saying he's a ladies man and some gross innuendo with his handkerchief. You know, I love weaving in a handkerchief reference. He is just nasty and his laugh too. He's one of those guys, he just bends over. Like he wants everyone to see that he's laughing at his own jokes and his mouth is all wide. His jaw looks unhinged. Just, ugh. How the hell does he attract even one woman to procreate with, let alone women who are drinking wine in his bathroom? Ugh. He's not even good looking. I don't get it. Okay. I mean, I could just go on and on and on, which I probably will if I keep watching this show, which I think I will. Now, I'm starting to wonder if this whole show is supposed to be about beautiful women and on the opposite end, alarmingly slow, shallow, and insecure, and therefore unattractive guys. For example, Austin. Okay, he is in, it's a term some friends and I came up with years ago. He's just a squiggle, okay? He's Overly moisturized, little low tone, highly talkative. You know his mom irons his pleated khakis just the way Austin likes some. He's just a squiggle. Now, Shep is Disney's human goofy. Like, he wouldn't even have to go to the character university to get in costume and walk around the Magic Kingdom. He's just the real deal, natural born goofy like a goofy child prodigy. And you know who Naomi looks like? A female brontosaurus. Mm, You know what I'm talking about. You know that children's book? I think it's like Edwina or something. I'm picturing like a little flower thing. It might be the mom on the TV show Dinosaurs. Remember that? Okay, it doesn't matter. She just has like a very mesozoic era DNA about her. I'm just convinced of it. Now, I'm thinking Southern Charm is going to stay in the main lineup, but I may need to go back and kind of watch some older episodes, at least from this season, just to catch me up to speak, because I feel like I'm throwing a lot of questions out at you that I need answers for. And plus, I think, you know, knowing the backstory will give me more ammunition to crack into some of these assholes more accurately. Okay, well, let's add some bougie and ratchet calling to this week with some Teen Mom 2. Picking up where we left off last week, 
Janelle is just blasting Barbara for Kaiser's supposed alleged abuse. And Adam was arrested. Javi and Brianna went on vacation together. And then, remember, Leah was feeling uncomfortable about it. So she told Kel. God, her accent kills me. So let's start with Janelle. Surprisingly, not a whole lot of Janelle this episode. Would you ever have thunk it? I was supposed to have court for custody of Kaiser with Nate's mom, but she postponed it. So we're waiting on a new date after the reunion. Ooh, good burn, Janelle. So Janelle is packing for this reunion, and she's telling David how she hates them because of all the drama. Hmm, who does that remind you of? Huh, who else hates negativity in their life and thinks it's everyone else's fault? Hmm. Maybe Sophia can shed some light on it. Hint, hint. Now, Janelle and David just hype each other up in the worst way. And every guy Janelle is with does the same thing. They isolate her and then they blame everyone else for both of their own shitty decisions. And and I'm not saying this to say that Janelle is innocent. It is not all David. Janelle is a monster. But at what point do you see... If it is always someone else's fault, Janelle, I'm looking at you, the common denominator must be, hmm. And if you really think about this whole situation with Nate's mom, Janelle is hating on Doris for the same thing Janelle herself is hating Barbara about. They both want custody of whatever kid because they think that the person raising them is being abusive in some way. I don't think any of us trust any of these people with any children, period. They all raised menaces to society, and now they all want to lay claim to this next generation. It really is scary. Now, let's dive into Chelsea's storyline. So Chelsea brought Aubrey and Watson to the hotel for the reunion. Okay, and that's it. So let's go on to Leah. Addie's at Jeremy's, so I can go to the reunion. I need to call Corey so I can plan for the girls's. So here's where we see Leah on the phone picking leftover beefaroni out of her Lee press-on nails, which she has filed into that same annoying shape that Leah Remini does. It's just a good thing she doesn't clean very often because, I mean, one scrub of a pot or pan and those CVS specials would go down the drain as quickly as my life does when 90 Day Fiance is on the air. So it turns out little Gracie is just like her mama and she doesn't realize that the cameras in her face at home are taping her for TV. Car cam falling asleep in the tanning salon scene. So Gracie, aka Aaliyah, is going to LA with Leah and Allie gets to stay home with Corey. I mean, let's be honest, Corey definitely cut the better end of the deal because Allie is so freaking cute. I love that kid. Let's fast forward to the hotel in LA and Gracie is there. Okay, remember, this is a snarky reality TV podcast. If you don't want to hear me talking, Nell, turn it off. Now, Gracie is acting like such a little brat. So much so that Leah says, act like you were acting earlier. (laughs) Sure, Jan. And then when that little sass pot just stomps away and says, I'm going to bed. Hmm. Well, gee, I wonder where she learned that. I guess this is Gracie's version of standing in her power, y'all. Well, now it's time to check in with Brianna. All right, so how's she dealing with all this drama pre-reunion? Well, she's stressed, so who's she going to go to? Her sister, Brittany, who I think is the greatest wing woman. I know she drives some people nuts, but I love that chick. She's strong. She doesn't care what people think. She doesn't take bullshit. She's the kind of girl that you want as your best friend because you know she's going to fight your battles for you so you can just keep eating your chipotle before it gets cold. I don't really know what that means actually now that I just said it, but I just know deep down in my heart, 
Brittany would appreciate you losing out on your burrito bowl. She's going to go head to head when she needs to. So Brianna continues to say that she and Javi are just friends, but mm, Brittany lays it out there that Javi wants to be more than just friends. She even calls him out for being nasty because apparently Javi has been trying to get with Brianna since she was pregnant with baby number two. Now, I still like Brianna, but I mean, the girl is lying. They may not be officially boyfriend, girlfriend, but they are definitely more than just friends. They're kind of like that Carol Radzi and Adam before she ordered eggs and he was still creating his radish art for her. So fast forward to LA. God, I love that there is a friend named Shirley that is along for the ride. I wish I had a friend named Shirley. There's no way someone named Shirley could be a bitch or a bad friend, right? So if you got a Shirley in your life, you better be treating the girl right. Well, later, Javi shows up in Brianna's room, and she's acting like she doesn't know if she's going to go out for the night, but she's all done up. She looks hot. Javi, on the other hand, I always thought he was kind of cute, but somehow he looks uglier when he's dressed up. Like His body just isn't made for business casual. But let's talk about casual for a minute. Now, these two have been saying it's been just very casual between them, but all of a sudden in this conversation, they're talking to each other while making eye contact with only the crew in the room, not even each other. And they're talking about moving states to be together or being in a long distance relationship. Okay, now that just doesn't make sense. It reeks of high schoolers trying to be Romeo and Juliet. If you're currently bottle feeding an infant, or you have an episiotomy or C-section scar, and you have a baby mama whose name is Kale, you might just be plain stupid if you choose to play this game, because it's not going to end well. Now, here's where we get to Kale. Kale and her gigantic ass implants that she must be regretting. I mean, look at those things. She picks Isaac up off the bus and she proceeds to storm into her kitchen where her friend Quay is just ripping apart a loaf of bread. (sighs) Damn to be in your 20s and not realize that that loaf of bread is going to be clinging to your thighs for the rest of your life. But Kale is, hold on for this one, She's annoyed because the Teen Mom 2 reunion is scheduled, but no one consulted her first and she hasn't gotten Lux's vaccinations yet. Now, she actually used the word annoyed, which annoyed me. Yeah, okay, Kale. MTV really should have just consulted you, sought out your baby book, your vaccination schedules to plan everyone else's production and PR. Get the hell over yourself. Enough about that pesky MMR. Let's get back to talking about Brianna and Javi, because not only is Kale pissed about Javi going on vacation with Brianna, she's also pissed off now that Brianna has texted her that she's sorry. Yeah, Brianna is texting that she's sorry about this miscommunication. She doesn't want all the drama. There's all these rumors. And she's saying, Javi and I are just friends. Well, I mean, gee, why would Brianna do that? Oh, how dare she? Brianna's text denial must mean that she is dating Javi. Because if she wasn't dating him, she wouldn't have texted and let the rumors keep going around. Mm, Okay, so Kale and Quay, who I'm just going to refer to now as Quail, are mumbling about how shady Brianna is for you know, talking directly to Kale and that Kale won't ever get along with Brianna because she's decided that she just doesn't want to. What kind of fucked up is that? Kale wants to be mad just because she wants to be mad. There's nothing that Brianna could have done that would have been the right thing to do in Kale's eyes. So we're going to fast forward to the taping in LA with all the girls So Kale is in the makeup chair and good old Bone is there to play Nanny Deluxe. And Brianna walks in, says hi to Kale. And immediately, 
Kale storms out and demands to talk to Larry. You know, a grown man with an executive position. Yeah, Kale has him in the hallway. She's yelling at him that she needs a separate room for her baby and boner, and she doesn't want to be in the same room as anyone else. What the hell, Kale? Yeah, okay, you have a baby. We get it. But don't be that asshole mom who wants the whole world to adapt to your preference because you had a baby. You chose to have a baby. You chose to bring the baby. This is your issue to figure out. It's not everyone else's problem. Kale, just like Janelle, is full on ferraing it. They even end up finding her a room, but now she doesn't like it because... (sighs) I don't know. It's like she was expecting a whole nursery set up for her kid who can't even see color at this point. Ugh. Like you're not freaking Oprah Kale. Now, if you are pro Kale, anti Brianna, I don't think you can even defend this because Brianna isn't even talking to Kale. And Kale continues to rant on and on and on to anyone who's willing to listen that she's uncomfortable. Well, that's life, Kale. Life is uncomfortable. It's not always going to be about you. Now, we don't see the actual taping of this reunion or flashbacks of it. Thank God I can't even take the reunions themselves, let alone flashbacks. So thank you, MTV. But afterwards, we see Leah waking up, whatever the hell her name is, Leah Gracie, what's her snot? And Leah says that she always wakes the girls' up this way by pouring water on their hairs is. Uh, uh, no, I don't think that's very appropriate or kind. However, this may be the only way that Leah actually showers her kids. So maybe this is her version of like a West Virginia mom hack. Now, someone also hacked up her bodysuit she's wearing because holy reject from a rock of love. And okay, Oh, okay. I'm just going to say it. Did Leah seem a little off to you? Not just during the later party where everyone was drinking, but in this scene, she's got this little bottle. She's very shifty, jumpy. Her eyes are darting everywhere. It's like she's on too much caffeine or speed or something. Uh, What's in the travel mug? Let's leave it at that. Okay. Oh, and there's Chelsea. She likes baby kisses. Oh, hey, there's Janelle. How did you not get into the middle of all this yet? Man, I mean, Janelle is probably thanking the stars above that she's not the center of hate and disgust this season. Because now that Brianna's here, she's just getting the brunt of everyone's shit. So Mama Janelle's just going to lecture Brianna. I know I get such shit for liking Brianna, but I'm sorry. She looked freaking gorgeous. But Janelle is telling her how this whole group of mom works. Yeah. Let's remember that these girls are moms, not teens anymore. Scary thought, right? Okay. Well, it gets really weird right after this because it is worlds colliding. The moms from Teen Mom OG are coming in. They're mixing. We see some Gary. I mean, how can you miss Gary? But they're taping this special, which I believe was the New Year's Eve special. And then, bam, out of nowhere, you hear a voice echoing from the underbelly of the courtyard saying, I fell at Walmart. (laughs) There she is. St. Barbara of North Carolina, or maybe it was South Carolina, or both, but the dainty little buttercup now requires a crutch. Just one, not two. Turns out that uh, little Babs had a nasty spill and, you know, she gets tired by the end of the night, maybe a little tipsy after a few drinks. God love that woman. I would never want her as my mom, don't get me wrong, but she'd be a hell of a good time on a senior's cruise, am I right? So to keep this good time going, Brittany and Javi arrive. Ooh. Brianna is filling them in on Kale's temper tantrum earlier, and Javi is just thinking about mm, boobs, and Brittany even calls him out on it, which is why I love her. But you know we can't just have people having fun and laughing when Kale is around. She will not have it. So 
Kale storms through the group of them and then steals the spotlight and the bathroom. And she says she's going to be a while in there. Now, I have never heard of anyone in my life making it known that they are going in the bathroom and they're going to be a while. I mean, I know she was changing because she was bringing some clothes in, but was she really? I think, or I'd like to think, that Kale hit up the craft services table too hard and now she's got the uh, case of the poopsies. It would make sense because then she was claiming Lux was crying and she had to leave, but suddenly he was fine the next day. Just saying. So while Kale is gone taking care of Lux, let's put that in quotes, taking care of Lux, the pretend party scene is being filmed with the Teen Mom 2 and OG cast. David is saying he's going to do seven shots and he's got two lined up for Janelle. (laughs) You know, David really is a gentleman, always ladies first. For example, he calls anyone who had a baby when they were 14 over for a drink. What a charmer. And he says it in a way that really pisses you off because he's saying it like he's paying for them. However, even free drinks in a trip to LA, complete with hair, makeup, wardrobe, it's still not enough for he and Janelle because these two are never happy and they start bitching about how Barbara is there to get free drinks too. Hey there, pot, me kettle. And then you hear David yelling for an executive producer that he needs more beer. But then when they say that they're cutting it off for the night, David says he's going to go to the store for more. Now, maybe I watched this incorrectly or I didn't see a facial expression, but David seemed okay for a second. But then all of a sudden you see him tussling with these balloons and popping a bunch of them. And you see everyone's faces like, oh my God, what's happening? And then the cameras turn, they start following him. Now, I mean, I admit that is a very weird reaction. I mean, have you ever seen anyone just go off on a bouquet of balloons? I mean, if balloons piss him off that bad, can you even imagine what he would do to like a clown or a mime at a kid's birthday party? No, actually, clowns and mimes scare the shit out of me. So I might, well, no, I can't say condone that ish. Now, there's also this confrontation after the party between Leah and Brianna. And Leah is such a freaking liar. She did tell Kale that Brianna and Javi were going to be sharing a room. Yeah, I know she's drunk, but that's not an excuse. Leah is a liar, and I kind of think that she knows it was on camera what she said to Kale, and it's going to be outed. She'll be outed for being the backstabber that she is. And total side note before we move on from this, I'm dying to know what she was doing on that table. It looked like she was playing like a game of jacks or old school marbles or some shit, or well, it is Leah. I mean, maybe she was just getting caught up on her hooked on phonics homework. It's a school night after all. Now, the next scene is what we've been getting teased with for weeks. And that is the showdown between Brianna versus Kale. I thought it was going to be earlier in the episode in that first pre-reunion makeup room, but no, it's here. I think Brianna was the very calm, more mature one at least in how she brought it up with Kale, okay? She just wanted to address the issue that she never planned on sharing a bed or a room with Javi. She told Javi that he needed to tell Kale about their vacation or hotel suite situation. And Leah was the one who mixed everything up. And they didn't even share a hotel because they had that Hurricane Irma. So what is the issue at the end of the day? Well, you know what the issue is. The issue is that Kale needs to have issues in her life, or she's just not Kale. I mean, the matter is cleared up, nothing happened, but now Kale has to keep going on. Now that it's not the vacation, it's that she wants to know, are Javi and Brianna dating, yes or no? And although Brianna doesn't even know the status of her own relationship, Kale is demanding to know. It blew up. Now, Brianna, is she being totally honest? No, but I think she 
isn't sure where things are with Javi. So how would she explain it to Kale? But it, it just blew up because Roxanne is there. She jumps in and then Kale starts to get pissy with Roxanne. And then Brianna jumped in and I got to say, I love it. I loved how Brianna stood up and was like, you are not going to talk to my mom like that because I would like to think I would be the same way if someone started talking to my mom shitty. But then Brittany pipes her little head and was like, mm, who you calling Ratchet? And whoa, it just goes off. Say what you will about Brianna and her mom and her sister, but those three love each other fiercely. And I like that they stick up for each other no matter what. I'd hope that my kids would do the same thing if someone were coming for one of them, especially if it's Kale, because I think Kale is becoming one of the worst teen moms ever. I think I would put her in the category of a Janelle, a Farrah. There's, okay, she's not like the porn star. She's not maybe outwardly beating her kids. She's not doing that. I think she can be a good mom, but just as a person, teen mom is just making her come undone. Okay, now next week, Janelle has some braids in her hair, minus some feathers, and Brittany might start swinging, fingers crossed. Now let's talk some Real Housewives of Potomac right after a quick break. Hey there, mama. Yes, I'm talking to you, sitting there in yesterday's Old Navy compression pants that haven't seen an elliptical machine or treadmill in weeks. Okay, maybe never. Now, if you're a stay-at-home mom or full-time working mother, divorced, single, or the happiest wifey on the block, we've been there. You could say we're the two friends who have been through the good, the bad, and ugly of life, relationships, dating, and motherhood. I'm Carrie from Sip and Shine Podcast. And I'm Jody from Reality TV Podcast. AKA your new best friends hailing from the East Coast. And the Midwest. We know what it's like for real moms and real women. With a thirst for trashy TV, good books, a fast metabolism, dateline with that silver fox, Mr. Morrison. And some nice frosty cocktails when we're not on a diet. We vent and divulge the twists and turns that is being Moms on the Rocks. Moms on the Rocks podcast coming to your favorite podcast app in May. Last week in Potomac, the ladies were tearing each other apart at the dinner table. Basically, it was Team Charisse or Team Candace. They're all piling on Candace on whether her mom or her fiance bought her engagement ring. Super stupid. Who cares? So they're at this resort now and they're trying to pretend like their standards are so high. They're picking their rooms. Okay, Karen and Giselle. Okay, let's have a moment. We saw your kitchens last year. Do not be acting like you both just moved from Camille Grammer's house that she got from Frasier. Knock that shit off. A truth be told, I cannot stand Giselle. She says the meanest shit. And then she'll say right afterwards, like, oh, no shade. Oh, I'm not saying it in a bad way. No, Giselle, you are the worst. You mean exactly what you're saying. You are just a mean girl. But then on the other hand, I think Candace is annoying as hell. I can't really side with her. I really hope she's just a one season wonder because I can't with her pageant girl shtick. Now, Monique, Ugh, Monique, Monique, again, I want to like you, but we got to address this drinking issue. The whole episode centers around, does Monique have a drinking problem? Do I think she fell asleep behind the wheel because she drank too much. <laughs> yeah, she did. But do I think she has a drinking problem? No. I think Monique is probably just out with these ladies a lot for filming. And we know what they do on Housewives. They bring alcohol to loosen the ladies up. She seems, at least what we see, like she's able to function otherwise. Maybe she doesn't. I don't know. I just think that... This whole storyline seems to be a bit much. They're all just jumping on it because they can. Now, I do feel badly for someone. I'm actually struggling feeling bad for them at the same time, and that is Ashley's mom. I mean, the woman is getting a really bad edit. I don't think she really signed up for the show. 
If she did, it's probably because she needs the money, but does she deserve it? Does she not? Yes, she's taking advantage of Ashley, but maybe we don't know the whole story. I feel like I was just getting bitter about worrying about Mother Ashley because I feel like I can't fully appreciate the show and focus on what's going on. And that would be the food at that dinner table. I mean, you can hear me getting shifty in my chair because I'm getting hungry. And when I watch shows like this with skinny women sitting around a table with multiple courses, what is a girl to do? You could have left me daydreaming about those carbs being served all day long. I don't need the fancy escargot and all that stuff. Just a good warm bread and butter. Oh, I could die happy. I mean, I actually think that many choices like they were giving the women at the restaurant, it can be really stressful, especially if you're not paying because you want to take advantage of everything, right? You're probably just like, hey, what's the biggest portion size on the menu? Because that first little itty bitty dish made me a little concerned. I was also a little concerned about that butternut squash dish because any gourd in a risotto or soup form, I'm sorry, it tastes like breast milk. It does. But back to these ladies. Karen surprisingly was being more reserved than she usually is until the end of dinner. That free champagne buzz kicked in and Karen just lets it all out. She's still pissed about Giselle and Sharice and Robin talking crap about Ray last year and she wants them to back off and apologize. Surprisingly, Giselle agrees right away. And that's when you see Robin take a minute to process what she's just witnessed. We're not dumb. Robin and Giselle are tight. I used to like Robin season one, but now I just think she, oh, she just sucks. She's boring. She thinks she's funny. I don't think she's funny at all. I think she thinks she's above it all. And the clincher of it all is that she and Giselle are co-conspirators. Those two come as a pair. And when Robin sees Giselle is kind of taking this step back and agree to apologize, she's got to come in, stir it back up, and reignite the stupidest feud. To me, it just came across as really thirsty, really tired, like the argument is done, stop working so hard at this table, and get rid of that granny sparkle blazer. What the hell was that? Not a fan of anything Robin is doing at all this season. And you know what? I'm going to lump Shasha in here too. Why is she even there? Sharice is the worst. I say everyone is the worst, but really those two are the worst. When she comes in with a, Karen, I know how you feel with the feelings that you feel, but you need to apologize for the B word. Ugh, just shut up, Sharice. Why did Bravo even have her back as a friend of? What could she possibly have promised to deliver? All she does is sit there, she turns her nose up at everything, and she's got nothing to back anything she says up except for a really bad home renovation addition last season. Now, fast forward to this video phone footage. Why? Producers, listen, why do you always leave during the best parts of the night? Is this like a union work hour issue? Housewives in their swimsuits will always be good for TV. Oh, wait, pause on that, except when we're in Potomac. Womp, womp. Because all we see with this crew is Grandma Karen telling us about her bedtime curfew And then Candace keeps trying to make cigars happen. If you're going to do this secret footage stuff, I need to see Real Housewives of Beverly Hills, Drunk Gymnastics, or Vicki Gumbelson hiding her face like Blanket Jackson, or nothing at all. Now the next morning, oh God, holy shit, Giselle is acting like she's never seen a smoothie before. And Sharice is hard at work trying to earn her, they're not holding diamonds. What the hell are they holding in the beginning? Like lily pads or an ore or something? I don't know. But 
Apparently, Karen was having this drunk heart-to-heart with Sharice last night, and she spilled the Huger horchata with her. And what's the first thing that Sharice has to do? She's going to just tell it all. But first, outdoor sports. Oh, and before that, guess what? Robin's son lost a tooth. Who the fuck cares? I watch this show to get away from real life. I don't need to know about Juan Jr.'s dental health. Replace Robin. We need to like hashtag replace Robin. What I do need to know is what's going on with Blue Eyes and Karen. Now, these are the scenes that I watch Potomac for. So Blue Eyes is Karen's driver. And word on the street is that Karen has been having this affair with this driver blue eyes of hers. And he was also seen spotted canoodling at Oz. I do believe that Karen had or is having an affair with this guy, but I actually don't believe that she would be all hot and heavy at Oz because the only reason people go to Oz is to see housewives. So why would she be so open with it there if she's trying to hide it? By the way, speaking of Oz, I still want to have a meet up there if I survive this road trip to Disney with my family in a few weeks. I, oh, here's a, here's a good transition. You're going to like this one. This road trip for me will be like the open ropes course. I actually do think I would like the ropes course that they are on. I don't know why it doesn't scare me. I would think that it would be something that would, but I don't know. I kind of want to do it. And seeing Karen shaking, like her muscle tone is shaking, on that kitty course. God, that was hilarious. I mean, all her body just trembling. <laughs> she can't even like, oh God, it was just awesome. I actually had a little open ropes course moment of my own this morning. I was leaving the gym. God, I can't believe I'm telling you this, but I was leaving the gym and I was looking down at my phone, pausing my podcast and, you know, my old lady eyes. I'm getting older. I'm scratching my head like the grand dame. I'm not that old, but I'm getting older. And I think I just misjudged the distance between my foot and the first step going up. And the ball of my foot, like my toes hit the step, but it was so far away that I ended up kind of just doing a very deep forward lunge, and which caused me to say, oops, really loud because I still had my headphones in. I didn't quite make it to the pause button. And you know, when you have your headphones on, you're talking really loud. So it was a very loud, echoey, oops. And then all the seniors looked at me and, you know, I mean, I'm an equal opportunity asshole. Okay. I can laugh at myself too. All right. Now, where was I? Uh, Okay. Back to Potomac. Let's talk about Monique with this confrontation again about the alcohol at the table. Monique should not have been driving. None of us condone drinking and driving. I'll just say, if you're drunk and you do something stupid, fess up to it instead of saying, oh, you were tired and that's how it happened because people are going to think much less of you otherwise. Now, Ms. Grandom Huger doesn't quite get out of the hot seat just because Monique is at the table. The conversation turns to, well, actually, you know what? Karen kind of brings it up herself, but it turns to this whole blue eye situation. And I'd say the same thing to Karen as I would to Monique. Just admit it and then move on. The only reason people are harping on it is because you're denying it when there is clear proof that you're in the wrong or that you've been caught. It's basic Housewives 101. We learned it all. Think OC season one with Gina Keogh. Remember, she was trying to make it sound like She was totally happy with her dick of an ex-husband when they were living together. Like, oh yeah, we're just two peas in a pod. We're living like my two dads. No, that doesn't really fit, does it? Perfect strangers, full house. You know what I'm saying. And that's really where they leave us hanging for Real Housewives of Potomac. So let's quickly discuss plans for the royal wedding this weekend. I love a royal wedding and a royal baby. So do two of my best friends that, gosh, we've been friends for over 20 years. We're going to get a hotel room Saturday night so we can wake up early, watch it together before we all have to get back to our normal lives where we mom it for the rest of the day between soccer and birthday parties. But we are going to have 
scones and the one of us who's kind of more cultured and traveled, she's going to bring clotted cream and jam and lime Tostitos and vodka. And we're going to have a little charcuterie and wine, cheap Amazon Prime fastener headbands. We're going to pretend we're princesses and cry over jealousy and pride. It's going to be great. And did you know that little George and Charlotte, they're going to get all dressed up. They're going to be in the wedding. And Kate, I mean, she's going to kill it. She's already got a post-baby bod, like, what, an hour after birth. So, you know, possibly might even upstage Megan. I do know I probably should bring my inhaler now that I think of it because I tend to get a little Mikey and the Goonies when I get excited about stuff like this. All right, so what else we got? Patreon. I'm going to have that up later this week with the Real Housewives of New York recap. Any listener secrets and questions, I'll let you know if I make a fool of myself again at my improv class. And, oh, I also have something super exciting, really exciting in the works. Hope to have it finalized in the next few weeks. I'll fill you in on it, but it is going to be so good. I cannot wait. Now, also... Real quick, I got to give a shout out. You got to go listen to one of our very own apples from the orchard, host of Sip and Shine. That's Miss Carrie. She flew out to LA this week to be a guest on For Crying Out Loud. Like, this is big time, you guys. It's a podcast, if you don't already listen to it, hosted by Stephanie Wilder Taylor and Lynette Carolla. Carrie was asked to share her journey with her incredible teenage son who has just gone through the ringer in the mental health system. and. Wow. All I can say is if you are a parent, if you are a teen, if you have children in your life, this isn't an ad. I'm not trying to pimp anything out. Really, you have to tune in. What this family has gone through, siblings, parents, Kiernan himself. God, Kiernan, you are so awesome. Your life, your story is going to inspire and motivate and inform and teach so many people you're awesome. You got to know it. Believe in yourself. And Carrie, you are such an incredibly strong mom and you are so brave to put it all out there. So, so proud of you. All right. Well, let's hook up on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook at Reality TV Pod. Do not forget to watch 90 Day Fiance this Sunday. I may just be releasing my weekly episodes earlier in the week because I don't think I can contain my 90 Day Fiance rants until Friday. So remember to subscribe, leave a little review, please. It will help me build my defense fund in the case I say too much about family Chantel. Talk to you later. Hasta la vista. Stay salty. Bye.